So let's give a warm welcome to our guest. Uh, today's talk is by Lana Novikova. She currently works as a technical writer at JetBrains. She specializes in documentation for developers, API documentation, internal knowledge bases, and developer portals launch. Today, she will explore the synergy between scientific principles and technical communication in API documentation. This talk is an extension of the topic, Let's Bring Science into Technical Writing, that Lana presented at Write the Talks Australia 2022. So without further ado, over to you, Lana. Let yeah, me... Hi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Good evening, <laughs> everyone. Um, hope you will enjoy the talk. I will just share my screen um, in a couple of seconds <laughs> to, to do that. Um, this one. Yeah, I hope you see and hear me well, uh, everyone. Um, today we will dive in into a bit, just a bit of science, no <laughs> serious stuff. Uh, I just wanted to try to apply some uh, nice scientific papers that I have found recently, and probably you have been stumbled on the, uh, upon them as well, but never have time to read through them. So I will do it for you. <laughs> And we'll maybe discuss or bring some nice examples of where we can see the scientific principles in the real world around us. Uh, my name is Lana Novikova. I work at JetBrains, a company that is known by making IntelliJ IDEA and PyCharm, for example, which is like tools for developers. And we are developing a tool for documentation as well. It's called Writer Side, and I am a technical writer at the documentation tool, which is, I think, um, pretty a recursive things. Um, as you already have heard, I uh, work mostly with the developers' documentation, work mostly with developer documentation and API documentation, and also I'm mentoring newcomers and like junior writers in my spare time. And I just want to bring more. Uh, great people into our, you know, um, into our area. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm particularly interested in such thing as uh, neuroscience and andragogy and like learning theory and cognitive psychology, like how to learn, how to teach people even better. That's why sometimes I'm diving into some scientific stuff. Um, so, yeah. Um, Let's proceed to the uh, actual uh, material. So um, as Giafrey already said, this isn't like an extension or like the next step of uh, from my talk at the Write the Docs Australia in 2022. Um, you can find it by the QR code. So what I want to tell you today is like, API documentation is something that is written for developers who are solving some specific tasks. So they almost like in a learning process. So they are exploring some APIs they have never heard about, like some APIs they need to solve some tasks. And it reflects, the documentation reflects the API architecture, which is very strictly structured. Like it has some pretty well-defined rules. And more than in other types of docs, with API docs, it's connected with the way people consume information on the web and how do they learn. So, which is studied by neuroscience and cognitive science. And I will try to guide you through a few scientific principles that may help you to produce more clear and understandable API docs or uh, any other docs, it's pretty applicable to any type of um, documentation. So the first thing, first, term that we will go through called pattern recognition, which means that it's, it came from the neuroscience. And what actually, what, what uh, does it mean is that human brain is very good at understand, identifying and understanding relationships between different pieces of information or data, make connections, 
and understand trends, even if uh, you have never seen some particular thing before. So the process of pattern recognition involves matching between the information we already store in our brain and something new. Um, so, for example, uh, a big part of pattern recognition is like theory matching or like uh, uh, template matching uh, theory, um, which means that it assumes that every perceived uh, object or information is stored as a template in our long-term memory and we are just sort of like matching it like uh, some form uh, for example this is circle this is circle and the same thing is actually um, like the some examples from the real world um, if, uh, one example is how kids or like people in general learn alphabet so uh, even if you they don't understand what like any sense behind the letter particular letter uh they're still like relating on the form and we can recognize like later we can recognize the same letter in like handwriting and in printed uh like as a printed element so we are like collecting it into this information in different boxes uh, one more example of the pattern recognition uh is uh is um, when we recognize faces. So humans are exceptionally skilled, skilled at recognizing faces, other human faces, because like we, uh, we can easily be uh, see faces in the on the photographs or in the crowd, and we know how like face is usually what elements it is collected from, and we are can identify different faces of like our familiar people, for example, which is not that easy for like for example other types of um, uh, biological creatures. Uh, this is called pattern recognition and these are like some real world examples of it. Um, so if we're talking about API documentation, I have found a very interesting article called Patterns of Knowledge in API Reference Documentation by uh, researchers Mali uh, and Robilardo. Um, so what they have done, they approach API reference documentation of two uh, big APIs, uh, this is like a description of classes and interfaces of the JDK 6 and .NET 4.0. And they have used content analysis to understand, discover how like how different types of knowledge are distributed through this API documentation. Like they wanted to observe what something that they have called knowledge patterns. Actually, it was not only content analysis. I will just show you how many methods they have been using, like a lot of things like different metrics, coefficients, like a different samplings, a length analysis, correlation analysis, but I don't want to dig into this deeper. Let's just put it that it was a content analysis. So they will go in through the whole um, amount of the reference and analyzing what like language constructions they have and which knowledge type of knowledge it belongs to. Um, so yeah, um, they wanted to, how I already said, to discover how different knowledge types are distributed through the API documentation. Um, and they come up with um, 12 knowledge types found in uh, API documentation, but for these two products. Um, and what they also wanted, they investigated this question also, how this knowledge type distributed from different perspectives, like, like relative to the different subtypes, like for example, for classes is this distribution, for interfaces this distribution, and how like uh, the proportion of how long these this types are in different references. So these are all the knowledge type they have found. Um, I will not be going through them one by one, but you can see like they're pretty um, clear that, like, for example, directives is when we are set telling user what to do, like do this, don't do that. Uh, so it, this is some clear um, directions in, in, in terms of like this, how, how it's done. Uh, purpose and rationale is something that explaining why we are doing some certain things or why is something designed this way. Um, like, for example, um, patterns is 
description of how to accomplish specific outcomes with the API, which is like some instructional text. Code examples is basically um, an example, samples of code and how to use and combine el elements. References are external links to some other documents. So there are 12 types of knowledge. You can probably find it in like any document or like in relatively any document. And the most interesting thing is that they have defined a special type of knowledge, um, which is called non-informational. This is something that contains, like that have no like actual sense. So uninformative boilerplate text or repetition of the uh, interfaces or classes names. So this is something that is, have that you can easily remove from the documentation and nothing will actually break or like um, happen. Um, so what they also found is that this distribution of the knowledge types in JDK documentation and .NET documentation is a bit different. Um, so on this graph, you can see the comparison of the proportions and from this information, you can see that um, functionality knowledge is the most pervasive uh, and structure is also common. Uh, so which you can see like, um, uh, yeah, uh, here uh, in the middle of this, uh, of the graph. And while other types like concepts and purpose and other ones, they are much rarer. And you can see the difference between uh, in how knowledge types actually are distributed in JDK and .NET. So you may see like JDK contains more conceptual information, not like drastically more, but still more. Whereas .NET, for example, contain more structural types of knowledge like structure and patterns. Um, yeah, and more examples and references as well. Um, so yeah, JDK uh, uh, contains more directives and concepts. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I had this one to mark the uh, important one here. Yeah, so concepts and purposes and also directives and the .NET contains more structure patterns and especially it's visible in the examples. Um, so what we should do with this information. Like this is an interesting uh, research, uh, but how we can apply it to the real life. Um, as you may have seen this, you can, I think this is quite um, frequently used types of knowledge and how they are like, uh, are distributed between the, throughout the documentation is also quite uh, recognizable. So you have, some decent amount of the functionality descriptions usually. Uh, also, you have uh, some samples, you have some directions, like what you, you need to do that, you need to do that. And uh, this is actually an interesting thing you can perform with your own documentation. So you can, of course, content analysis is some like serious, serious method and it requires some work, but you can do just in, uh, uh, easy way, easy variation of the content analysis uh, uh, to tr try to take any of your like API documentation or any other documentation and try to recognize the different types of knowledge. Uh, and for example, uh, what I can uh, advise is to color code these types of knowledge uh, with different colors. So you can either highlight it with some screen screenshot tool where you can use like copy the, only the text and highlight it in the Google Docs, which it allows to do. And you just will understand something about your documentation. Like, okay, I have this distribution, what it says about my documentation. It has more conceptual part, but not that much of the practical directives or not that much examples. Um, so you will just dig a bit, a little bit more of how your documentation is actually, what it consists of. And also one, another thing is that this information about the knowledge patterns in the API documentation can help you to develop documentation templates that are 
adapted to the knowledge uh, types commonly associated with different types of API elements. So you can just, um, for example, you understand that, okay, the model that is uh, con contains the three knowledge uh, patterns is suits me well. Uh, and you can create a template based on this. And if you don't have time to create templates or for some reason you just, I don't know why, uh, you can either use uh, like many tools provide um, already provide ready to go templates, but I want to you to uh, I, I I want to uh, have a second and praise and say thank you to the Good Docs project who maintain a great template library with uh, in various markup languages. So you can just come to the Good Docs project. Um, repository and grab some templates already. Uh, and also, you, if you want to participate in developing them, also come up to the docs. The Good Docs project is quite a good community, very welcoming, and I recommend it highly. Um, so <laughs> this is about a bit about templates uh, and a minute of uh, you know recognition for a very nice project. Um, this is how you can apply this theoretical thing to the sort of re your real uh, documentation. So color coding is the way of doing content analysis and using templates or creating your own or grabbing uh, the ones that someone developed. Um, one more uh, concept that I want to guide you through uh, today is called learning styles. Uh, learning style is uh, basically like an individual way of how we learn things. Um, so um, there is no like single most effective way of learning things. Um, it varies from person to person. It depends on the task you're accomplishing and depends on the information uh, you're like, uh, you're trying to learn and once you know the different approaches to learning, you can consider um, what is most beneficial either to you or to your uh, user, which is actually reader is somewhat someone who is soaking up the uh, knowledge and you as a technical writer or someone who is writing the content, you're actually a teacher. So you're guiding them through, uh, you want them to learn how to use your product and that's why this learning style theory is quite applicable to the technical writing because um, this is like pretty obvious that people don't consume information the same, all the same way. Like when they come somewhere, they're like, okay, I start with this, then do this and do that. This is not how it works. Uh, so in educational theory and learning theory, uh, there are a lot of attempts to make a decent one correct um, learning styles uh, classification, but it's actually hard. Um, so um, as I have said, it's like an individual, individual learning method and it will differ from situation to situation and it will likely change over time, but still this model can help uh, you to like understand that people consume information differently. So how we can, what we can do based on that, we can imagine that API usage is a learning process and we can try to make it easier for the people with various learning style. Uh, so depending on what they need first, like for example, they want to dig into practice first. So we need to get, get them to do that or they need more conceptual information first and we need to do that as well. So different people, uh, need different things to start learning right away. Um, I have checked Wikipedia and it actually uh, says that there is more than 70 different uh, classifications of the learning styles. So the most famous one is David Kolb's model, uh, but it's quite an old one. Like David Kolb is a, like a, quite a figure in the learning theory. You may know maybe I have heard about his uh, concept of the learning cycle, uh, but it's criticized heavily because it was like very dichotomical 
it it dichotomizes uh, individuals on the like abstract, concrete, and reflective actionable dimensions, which is like modern learning theory considers incorrect. So I want to introduce you to the uh, learning style model by Peter Honey and Alan Mumford, which is more modern in 2013. And they actually adopted the Kolb's experimental learning model, but they just developed it a bit more. So they have um, uh, aligned uh, four learning styles, uh, activist, reflector, theorist, and pragmatist. So activist is someone who is like, I want to start doing things right away, maybe learn fast, break things and all that. So they want to jump in into the tasks and then, then check what's going on around. A reflector is someone who likes to learn through observation and reflecting on the results. So they're doing uh, it in like some small steps uh, and observing what's going on around. Theorist is someone who needs to understand as much as possible uh, about like conceptual part, the theory, like I need to be prepared and then start practicing something. And pragmatist is someone who needs to be able to see how their actions influence the real world. So they need more like examples, use cases and all that. Um, so this is sort of like theoretical frame that you can apply uh, and maybe try to like, um, observe your users and try to find um, what learning style they tend to use more, or maybe try to reflect on yourself as well. And to support that, I actually found uh, one more interesting scientific paper, uh, which is called How Developers Use API Documentation uh, by Michael Mang, Stephanie Steinhardt, and Andres Schubert. Uh, so what they wanted to do is they have tested how different developers approach a new API they have never used or seen before. And they wanted to prove that content and structure of the documentation sometimes does not match their expectations and work habits. So this was these were their hypotheses. Uh, and what they have done is through active observation and filming screencasts and doing verbal protocols of participants, <clears throat> they have evaluated uh, how developers will approach new API. So they have taken 11 developers uh, and they were filming how they will uh, uh, solve um, eight tasks, um, sorry, five tasks. Um, on the IP that is not familiar for them, to them. And they were analyzing uh, what they will be doing on their uh, screens and which strategies they will adopt when starting to work with a new ABI. So uh, in the top, uh, they have uh, defined some content categories. Um, and these content categories were like, because this, they specifically selected this uh, API, which is called Ship Cloud. Uh, this is a sort of a library for uh, e-commerce projects. Uh, and these uh, content categories, they have specifically named the sections on the developer portals this way. So welcome page, concepts, integrations, samples, recipes, and reference, uh, just to make it more like easier to follow the patterns, how, what developers will do when they will land on the page, like uh, which you see uh, in the bottom of the slide. Um, yeah. So what they have uh, actually observed. Um, first of all, of the 11 developers participated in the study, Eight of them have solved all five tasks in 70 minutes. Uh, the other three solved only from one to three tasks. So the success rate wasn't quite uh, consistent. Um, and the overall mean time was uh, uh, 695 seconds. Uh, and there also was a variation between participants. 
But for us, the most interesting, interesting thing uh, is that the participants have used, like an average, the uh, API documentation about 49 time of their time, 49% uh, of their time, minimum 30%, uh, maximum almost 70%. Um, so from here, you can see that uh, like 49% they have spent in the documentation and 51 is like actually writing code and trying something in the CLI, in the terminal. So 51% writing code, 49 in documentation, which is quite surprising because they have used documentation a lot to explore the API that they are unfamiliar. And you can see also the distribution and the proportion of the time participants spends in different uh, content categories. Uh, such as concepts, samples, recipes, and all that. And you may see that uh, the uh, 59 is including, uh, 51 is including um, IDE where they've write it, co uh, wrote code postman and command line client. So they had, uh, like they were free in using any resources that they want, and they chose to spend 49% in the documentation which is, I think, quite, sounds quite reasonable and promising for us technical writers. Um, the content category that they have referred the most, you may see it's 18.35. Uh, it's API reference, which is followed by recipes, which like recipes means uh, like use, uh, how to's basically. Uh, and then aggregating the time for recipes and samples, which like both presented code examples for basic uh, use cases in like a sort of like cookbook fashion. Uh, and both con content categories uh, together are head to head with API references were active about like 21% uh, um, together, like 21% of the total time. And uh, on the other hand, the concepts page is used as well, but much less compared to other categories. And this is like, it shows that API reference. So this is like sort of like a navigator your, through your API. And not only that, the developer will need some particular endpoint or parameter or something like that, but watching at the API references, they may see like the API in its entirety, uh, like what you can do here. So they were using not concepts, not like recipes, but API references for that uh, matters. This is quite uh, also interesting information, like proving that it's actually still needed by someone. Um, and also they had calculated like, is there any distribution in using API references from experienced developers and not so experienced, and there is no particular, no like significant dif no difference. So everyone is using API references um, equally. But there is another interesting thing. Uh, um, so we have talked about like they spent 49% in the documentation and that they used mostly API references, but there is interesting thing that there's considerable variations between participants, uh, how they have been allocating the time uh, to different content categories. So what we see from this uh, table is that uh, this is the mean value by participants for the resulting categories like API reference uh, concepts examples and other because they're not that significant. Uh, so what we see is that there are like, we see major differences in the distribution. Uh, some uh, like for example, participant six spend a lot of time in reference and participant eight spend a lot of time in concepts and examples. Uh, and for example, we can see participant four who also spend a lot of time in reference and zero time in so concepts. So there is this quite significant variations. Uh, and the table, this, this table actually reveals that uh, participants differ in whether they use information from concepts a lot or 
not using it at all. So for example, you see eight and 10, they're relying on the concepts a lot. And like, for example, one and four, they were not spending like, like they, they were spending zero time in the concepts, which is quite, I think, uh, interesting thing to uh, understand, like, why is it so? Why they're that different in what they're actually doing? And based on this data, the researchers, uh, Michael Meng, Stephanie Steinhardt, and Andreas Schubert, uh, they have defined three information seeker developer persona uh, and the approaches they use when looking for information to put a new ABI at work. So what they have, they have taken three developer personas. This is not their invention, like these particular personas, uh, because they have taken the these from the Clark's article. How is an end user software engineer? What is an end user software engineer? Uh, but they have like adopted this methodology. So systematic learners, opportunistic learners, and pragmatic learners. So who are they? Systematic learners are someone who seek to understand the API before they use it. So on the table here, this is clearly the ones who were using concept information uh, the most, like P, uh, participant aid, for example, is a systematic learner. So they want to, uh, they started every task with a, uh, clean piece of code so they have taken the code from the example sample then they were digging into into uh, uh, concepts to understand what uh, like what they were uh, what that the actual concept they're managing and they were also using the recipes to extend this um, uh, example a bit more so they wanted to like be very prepared and like understand more details rather than just start learning code right start writing code right away um so yeah uh, the opportunistic learners they were seeking to get started as quickly as possible without like first understanding of the api or checking the documentation so they worked in more like intuitive manner and like risking making errors so i want to just like try double check what i what errors uh, do, uh, i have uh, and whether my like solutions were correct um, so they were uh, just writing some uh, code example right away then uh, a piece of code right away then modifying it extending it uh, may and they were not taking any time to get a general overview of the API before starting the first task. And the third is actually a combination of both. So they are not that brave to just start writing code right away, uh, but they are actually not digging that deep than like, for example, systematic learner. Um, so there's something in between, not that risky, but still like they uh, were reading some uh, information and at least digging into the API reference. Um, so you may notice that these learning styles, like these developer personas, are corresponding well to the honey mom first classification that we have discussed previously. Like activists is very similar to the opportunists, so they want to start as much uh, as fast as possible. And theories is somewhat reminding us about systematic learner. So it seems like this learning the uh, styles theory and this developer personas defined by the researchers is quite similar in some ways. Um, so what's in it for us? Uh, first of all, as other writers, as content creators, we need to, we have to respect the different strategies that developers adopt when approaching a new API. So not just read all that and then start. We need to try to manage the way they're getting the information so we can uh, give them this information redundantly, like all the information should be there, but all the additional information should be somewhere a few clicks around. 
Um, for example, for opportunistic developers, we can make complete and comprehensive code examples and we can make them easier, it easier to them to uh, manage only code examples. For example, I have found a few examples from the real world APIs that I found quite reflecting that idea of different learning styles. Um, this is an example from Twilio docs. And what you can do there is that you can make the code example visible like the on the like, as a full uh, full page. So you, you can hide the API, the reference part, the detailed description of each parameter. And if as a developer you want to work only with the example, you're free to do this. And then you can uh, get back to the previous mode. This is quite, I think, uh, you know, adaptive for the different types of learners. If you need reference information, we have it, but if you don't need, you can watch, uh, you can work only in the scope of the code example, which is like nice and thought, well thought. Uh, another example is how you can connect the actual referential part and the conceptual information with the code. So they have this text to code synchronization. So when you click on some particular part in the request or response sample, you can see which part in the reference it corresponds to. Um, this is an example from Spotify API docs. And what you can do more, much simpler, like if you don't have a lot of, you know, like a front end developer who will do that for you, uh, you can just try to highlight parts uh, using some less advanced uh, tools, like for example, highlighting in the code uh, corresponding to some particular um, like note, for example. So you can just use simpler tools you have uh, at your hands, in your hands. And uh, not only like this cool synchronization, but this is just also a good example of how uh, you can respect different type ways of what is important to the developer who are consuming your API. Um, for systematic learners, you can provide important information redundantly and give some relevant background knowledge. So if they want first to like understand what this API is about, like domain related background knowledge. You can also do that, like include some information about, for example, I don't know this is transactions, what they do uh, into the reference. And I can show you an example from Stripe API. Uh, they are quite famous for having nice documentation. And if you like, you know, have this top 10 well-looking docs, you usually, you, you probably will see a stripe in there. And what they're doing is that they have this, uh, the structure of the API uh, reference is reflecting the domain knowledge. So they're not like structuring using endpoints, like this endpoint, this endpoint, this endpoint, but they have like the concept, like for example, balance, balance transaction, charge, customers. And first they put all the information about this object, like what is balance transaction? What is it all about? What these, these are related guides, you can read more. And then you have information about the endpoints that are related to this particular object, which is quite like interesting navigation solution. And for all others, you can enable face access, fast access to the API implement tryouts, action-oriented documentation. Uh, so from the research, you can see that regardless to the learning style, developers still want to start uh, start using this API successfully uh, and fast, like systematic learners and not doesn't mean that they want to learn slow. They just want to know more, but they still want to start fast. And this is a nice example from the Dropbox. They have not only like just this tryout block because tryout block is something that is quite, I don't know, maybe I think it's uh, already a normal basic thing in the API references, but these are is uh, um, API playground. So you can play out with the API without like starting writing code right away. So you can request the access token and play in this sandbox and like try to send some uh, requests and see what's going on.
And this is in, in, an example from render. This is actually also a good uh, example because they have like the first point in navigation, the one you land when you are uh, searching for the API called quick start. And this like tiles for each of the code language uh, for the programming languages and frameworks. Uh, you can click on them and they're actually like literally one to three steps to start. So this is quite cool that you can start right away and try something uh, very quickly, where it's a simple example. And another one is also from Twilio, which is quite interesting. They have this reference that we have seen before uh, on another example, but they also have on the main page, like welcome page of the API, like developer portal, they have very simple examples. So if you don't want to read documentation, because it says like read docs and it has links to docs, but if you don't want, we have an example of how to create a WhatsApp message using our API just from here. Like you don't, if you don't have time to proceed to the extended documentation, which is quite interesting approach, like placing the example on the welcome page, like the uh, landing page of the documentation portal. So what I wanted to say with my talk is that it's actually, you don't need to repeat this, like, you know, uh, sophisticated, uh, with a lot of respondents, uh, research done by this, um, uh, by, by these groups of researchers, uh, but you can like make, uh, can take some long hanging, like low hanging fruits. So you can do the same, but a bit easily. So for example, do content analysis with that just simple color coding and without like taking just all the documentation, but some, a few documents to see what's going on in your documentation. Or you can ask some two or three fellow developers, like, please try to start using my API. I want to see is like how my documentation is working, what you will start with, where you will go next. So you can just approach some simple researches uh, and call yourself something of a scientist, <laughs> which is like not that hard. Um, here on this slide, I provide links to the mentioned uh, researches. If you will ha want to dig deeper uh, into them, there are a lot more in there. This is not all <laughs> that I have told you. And let's stay in touch. Uh, these are my, my contacts. Um, I'm always ready to answer your questions to talk about API and developer stocks. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you, Lana. That was a very uh, interesting session. Uh, let's take up a few questions from the chat. Um, we have a question from Nikila. How will non-informative knowledge type use, uh, help users consume the API? Oh, that, that's actually a very uh, interesting question because um, uh, the, this is fun because it's, it doesn't help. This is something that they have discovered that there is pretty decent proportion of the non-informative things in the documentation, but this was not their documentation. So they are just researchers, like silent observers. They can't like influence the experiment. So they have taken the this uh, reference information in its entirety. But this is interesting because another observation of them is that they had the correlation analysis which I haven't included into my presentation because like it will be just endless, uh, literally. And the correlation between the informative and non-informative parts obviously is negative. So the more uh, this repetition, repetitive boilerplate things you have in the documentation, the less actually useful parts you have in the documentation. So the right thing is that if you have that the proportion of this repetitive things or non-informational things in your documentation is big, you need to get rid of them. So it's just because it's not a like UX research for the particular, like they're not interested in like, okay, guys, you need to fix your documentation because we found this. They're just, you know, this 
uh, independent researchers, so they, they haven't done anything without uh, with it. But I believe that if the that the developers of the documentation to these um, libraries had to do something with it, they need to. Uh, just wanted to get in there, so you may see that this is that many more knowledge types that they can include if they will remove this non-informative uh, things. So uh, this usually is, this is some any uh, this is not even a complete sentences like they mm -hmm. had like the examples of this uh, non-informative parts in the uh, in, in the article. So this is usually some you know um, repetitive repetition of the uh, class and interfaces names and okay. like some some this stuff and there are like a lot of them. I think this is this may be connected, but this is just a hypothesis with the that uh, they have uh, auto generated. I think decent part of the documentation they have there. So this this may be uh, the reason why there is that much of the text because like if you use for example Java doc, it has some it generated to some particular structure and this this may be just a, a consequence of the auto generation. So we just need to fix it like after you generated it to do something with it manually. We have another question. How do you apply the learning styles when writing a documentation for a user base? Are there any patterns that can be implemented to know the user's learning style? Well, oh, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> um, I actually, this is something that I started just recently. Um, mm -hmm. We added, uh, we tried to add the learning styles into our user personas. So mm -hmm. usually you have like not much dimensions into that. So you, for example, you have in uh, like, for example, junior developer who are just starting, like, for example, he in, uh, so you are describing them as a, uh, for example, they are interns or junior developers. And you have like middle developer who is like knowing uh, there is the thing, but still they uh, can uh, access your documentation and some experienced ones uh like the and you also describe in them so usually have dimension of the experience of the tools used like stack they're working on but i've tried to apply the learning style uh and this is actually pretty interesting because like uh, i was trying to uh find um some examples in the heat map so we have like this um in the analytics tool that we are using, we have not only the uh, the heat map that shows the mean values, but also you can watch some certain sessions. Uh, so how actual like one person anonymized, you know, only like, I don't know, browser and um, version uh, of the, like the user agent. So you don't know who is it in particular, but you can watch how they have re read your documentation. And you often like, it's quite surprising. Uh, and this is like, if you have something like that, this is a good way to uh, find some learning styles because you, you clearly see uh, something very similar to what these uh, researchers have seen someone are jumping right to the uh, examples. They're copying in them because you see that they click the copy button. Then yeah. they uh, read some information around and drop out. Uh, so what they like to, uh, to adopt it to the learning style of that such users, you need to make sure that your examples are uh, actually usable because often we place uh, in the documentation, this is an example, but it's like a part of some actually valid code. So you need to go through the whole flow to get the, all the like details. So we are now we are thinking, so there is no like, like silver, silver bullet. We are still also like just started to uh, right. approach this learning style thing uh, after I have uh, read about this article, read this article, but 
uh, first of all, we come up with the idea that we probably need, like you have this uh, part of the code that just shows some one particular action, so like boilerplate for the function, but there is an ability to like, to click some extent and you will see the full example with the like the whole file probably okay. and then like get it back so we have like get a bit more context and then hide the context um so yeah and for such developers who want just to like jump into it right away they also may uh, may enjoy some things like uh, runnable code sam samples, which we are also implementing right now. Uh, so you can run something right in the documentation and check how it works without like uh, copying it into the ID and then getting back to the documentation because there is a high chance they will never get it back. They will also try to break everything in the ID and like do it themselves. And for the like, there is another uh, pattern when they're like, try to read uh the like documentation a bit like a book like from top to bottom and they usually these users particularly they leave a, a feedback very uh frequently so they use search uh they don't uh have not found something particularly they have uh, vis usually they visit a few pages uh, in in the same visit, so you see that they they are very you know involved <laughs> into getting some particular information. So they are using all the abilities. They're reading from top to bottom, then they're using search, and they are leaving some negative feedback like I haven't found some particular thing. And this is I think close to the systematic learners, so they're trying to embrace all the information uh, and all that. So yeah, for them, you need to uh, give more like background knowledge. So, but not that much because otherwise you always like balancing between these two or like three uh, types. Uh, you can try to find your types because it's not like something you need to believe 100%. Maybe you will see some other patterns as well and tell us on some other event <laughs> that you have found new type of a developer. Uh, but still you need to like balance because when you're trying to include too much of a conceptual information, you will drop the ones who are who want just practical examples, for example. So yeah, this there is no like, mm, you know, particular answer to your question, but there are some, you know, I, I'm trying to understand how we can apply this, but this is definitely something already that I see that it's actually true because when I watch in these sessions, uh, I, I, I can like detect that, okay, they have this learning style probably because they are okay. starting from, uh, depending on what their, even their first action is. Okay. Uh, so one last question. Are there any books that document such scientific applications to doc writing? Oh, that's a nice one. I don't, um, I don't think I know any, but um, it's not like about uh, applications to doc writing in particular, but I think many books that are covering um, learning theory and like instructional design yes. they are quite applicable to the doc writing so there is no yes. like books called uh, scientific principles of the documentation but uh, I think we are pretty we can rely on what already done about information architecture uh, so these are like for example if you will see the UX writing they're also relying on the like behavioral theory a lot learning theory a lot so we are allies here with the like for example UX designers and UX researchers and the ones who are working for UX so you can just uh, watch a bit uh, like uh, watch a little bit you know wider and check the books about instructional design information architecture behavioral theory learning theory because like actually uh, teaching adult people is something that what we <laughs> in, we are just teaching them using the textual information, visual information, but there's not 
that much difference be between like tutorial that we are writing and some lesson that someone is teaching in the class. Um, so I think there is a lot of um, like not directly mm -hmm. uh, dedicated to writing, but still there is a lot of books that you can dig into. Maybe I can recommend you something and send to Gaia 3 and we will maybe share okay. some um, in the event messages. I think we can share some mm -hmm. materials for those who are interested okay. in reading something. Oh. Great. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think we'll have to bring this session to an end. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining today's session. Uh, special thanks to Lana for her insightful talk, uh, summarizing those two important research papers on API documentation, and most importantly, presenting to us in, a, in an easy to understand, digestible way. Uh, yeah, and my biggest takeaway from today's talk is learning how important it is to tailor your API docs to meet the le different learning styles of the developers. Uh, so uh, participants, so I hope Lana's talk